All right, my students, let's get into the Animation Basics lesson. We're going to learn how to set keyframes for animated objects and their attributes. Use the time and range slider and the playback controls. Use the graph editor to view animation curves. Modify the animations of objects using the graph editor. Render animations in various formats and edit the render attributes to change the quality of the final results of the render. Okay, so let's go ahead and open the chessboard.ma file out of our project folder. And you will notice, sure enough, there's a chessboard. And we are going to make a few moves here. So we're going to actually animate a couple of chess moves. Um, let's go to frame one. It should be there already, but make sure you're on frame one. You can do that a few different ways. You can click and drag on the time slider right here and just drag it to any frame you want. You'll see where it shows which frame you're actually on. Or you can just, um, this is the start time of the animation. That's the playback range. This one is the current frame. Yeah, so this one is where you can just pick which frame to put the playback head on by typing it in. These controls work like a VCR, so it's play forward, um, play backwards, and this is jump to the next keyframe and jump to the, or previous keyframe, and this one has jumped to the next keyframe. And you can also jump back to the beginning with that one. So what I want to do is select the, um, the white pawn in front of the king, and there's a few different ways to, I want to look at the um, channel box. And there's a few different ways to keyframe this. Um, one is by right clicking on it and um, well heck, okay. Right clicking on the channels you want to keyframe. And this is probably the best way. Uh, I'm going to give you the shortcut way first, which is Shift S. And that will, no, it's not shift, it's just S, I'm sorry. So that will set a keyframe, and you'll see a red line appear on the first frame. And that shows that that's a keyframe. And you'll notice that the channel box has changed color. Now, the problem with the S key is that it sets a key for all keyable channels. And that's kind of a drag because we're not changing the scale or the visibility or the rotate. And we're not changing the translate Y either. So um, right now, don't worry about it, but just put that in the back of your mind and hold on to it for later. And let's go to frame 60 or frame 60-ish and turn on the move tool if it's not already. And we're going to push this forward on the x-axis two squares and press S again and so that will be a 60 frame movement from its starting point to two squares forward just like that so oh and I should mention you you should have done this at the beginning of the semester but just in case open up your uh, animation preferences and you should see a playback speed of um, 30 FPS times one, and that corresponds to what the frames per second of the animation is set to. This one is set to 30 frames per second, so um, if I set it to 24, that, that value will change to 24. But the point is, play it in real time so that you're looking at the actual speed of your animation and not something different because this preview might not be showing you the actual speed of your animation if you don't set it to do that. So let's go to the black pawn opposite the white pawn that we just moved. And we're going to go to frame 180. skipping ahead. 
frame 90. We're going to go to frame 90 and select the black pawn. And this also is only going to be moving in the x-axis. This is the only way it moves. So one thing I can do is use the S key to set the, a keyframe on all the channels, but the better way to do it is to key only the channels you're going to be moving. So if you highlight the Translate X channel, right click on it and choose Key Selected. This is a better choice for animating. And I can go forward to frame uh, 150 or so and move it up to two squares forward and do a key selected on that as well. Okay, now I'm going to go forward to frame 180 and I'm going to select the white queen and I'm going to show you another shortcut to animate and set keys. Um, if you remember the move is W, R is rotate, no I'm sorry, E is rotate, R is scale. Now if you use Shift W, what it does is it keys all of the translate channels. If you use Shift E, it keys all the rotate channels. And if you use Shift R, it keys all the scale channels. So kind of an in-between state might be if you're just doing um, translations and no rotations or scales. You could always just use Shift W as a shortcut and you do get one dead channel, the one static channel. Um, again, keep that in the back of your mind. It's a cleanup thing, but we're not going to worry about it right now. But that's, that's a lot better than getting all of these static channels. So with that said, I will go forward to frame, I don't know, 240, I guess, ish. And what I want to do is I want to do a diagonal movement to over here. So I'm going to use the Z and X movement square. So I'm not, I know I'm not moving it up but I'm going to move it on the Z and the X. And then I'll press Shift W to set another key only in the translate channels. So that's, that's a really good um, kind of in-between choice um, where you're not setting the individual channels tediously, but you're also not making a keyframe on every single channel. There's, you're probably, on this assignment, you're not going to be using every single channel of, of animation. So, let's do a Black Knight movement, and let's get him threatening the pawn, the queen. So, actually, before I do that, why don't we just play the animation through just to make sure we've got what we want. So, white pawn moves forward, black pawn moves forward, and then the queen should move right here. So, that looks good. Okay, so starting around 270, I am going to select the black knight and press Shift W. And knights are one of the funky movers in chess as you move two squares in one direction and then one square in the other direction, uh, you know, to the side. So basically you would go like this. And let's have that movement happen at three. Three hundred or so. And do a shift W. So this movement now, because the way the knight moves, is going to cause a problem right about here. As you can see might be able to see it better in wireframe. The knight and the pawn are occupying the same space. Could be a little worse, but they're definitely occupying the same space. So 
this guy has to actually do a jump over the pawn. So that means his translate Y has to go from where it starts, which is resting on the chessboard, and it has to end resting on the chessboard, but in the middle, it has to be in the air so that it's above the pawn. So right around, right around here-ish, for me it's frame 284 or 285, for you it might be a little different, but right when it's right about at the pawn, let's do um, a translate up so that it's above the pawn and press shift W again and then it'll it'll do a lovely jump over the pawn and let's go ahead and play that back from the beginning okay so you may continue to play with this scene if you want and just experiment with more movement. Uh, otherwise, let's move on to the next. Okay, so for the next little bit of this guy, we're gonna create a camera. And I'm gonna do a camera and aim. show cameras all right looks like all the stuff is not showing show all I just clicked show all right there and let's turn the grid back on too for fun so um, I'm going to create a camera movement now and I'm going to do my usual camera one will be the top left panel and perspective will be the top right panel and I might flip around here and there sometimes changing things but I'm gonna stay focused on the night so I'm gonna point the camera at the night go. Hey, you went too far, buddy. Okay. And now I'll select the camera and just, I'm going to pan out quite a bit so I can see everything and move it up so I'm kind of looking down at a three-quarter view a little bit. So, and remember, you can just dolly and, and pan this around just like the perspective view, but just remember that also moves your camera. So when you're doing it in the perspective view, it actually technically moves your perspective camera as well. But at any rate, uh, I'm going to just do a slow zoom in, just a real simple movement with the camera. So select the camera and let's go back to frame one if we're not already there. And I will shift W to set a keyframe and you know what you know what I might do I'm thinking this is a little on the fancy side but I think you'll be okay with this uh, I'm going to parent the aim node to the um, horse, to the horse, <laughs> to the knight, so that wherever it goes, I can just, I, I don't have to mess with keyframing it, it'll just follow. So, under chessboard, black chess pieces, black knight one. Um, you can use the locator if you want. There happens to be a locator connected to this particular piece. And I'm going to take the camera one aim and I'm just going to move that over Black Knight one. 
and then basically when that moves as you can see the camera stays right on it because the locator the camera aim is parented to the night so wherever it goes the camera will follow okay so a little fancy but I think you can handle it um, and I'm gonna go forward to close to the end of the animation right around frame 300 or so and I'm gonna just bring that in a little bit Take a look at the orthographic top view. And move my camera around in the top view a little bit. So, and it's going to, when you're playing the, back the animation, it's going to play back the active frame. So I'm trying to, I keep trying to switch the active frame to the camera view, if you can see that. It's subtle, but there's a light gray square around the camera view right now. So now it's around the perspective. Whichever one that is active is the one that will play. Oh, I think I got... Okay, I tried to be too fancy. Okay, I have I the uh, camera locator, when, when I parented it, it inherited some of the values and it moved. So I have to just select the camera one aim and get it pointed at the uh, horse's head again here like that. I think that should do it. Let's just make sure it's all... Okay, yeah, now it's centered on the... And we can do a final little zoom in. One of the most common things that new students do is um, when animating the camera, um, tend to move the camera too fast. It probably should be taking slower movements. Whatever you have, slow it down. So let's do a little zoom in at the end there. Oh yeah, when you're tumbling around, that moves the aim around. That's what did it. Let's select the camera. And I am going to just... tool. Yeah, it's still a little tiny bit off from the from the actual night, but I'm not really too worried about it. So a little swoop kind of at the end there.
Okay, I want to click File, Open, SillyGuyQ.ma, and we don't need to worry about that. It's just a holdover from an older version of Maya. This usually doesn't matter either as long as the scene looks fine. If you're not seeing any of this, it means I fixed it by the time you got to it, so not to worry but not to worry if you do see it either. Um, so the silly penguin. In this section we're going to learn about the channel control window and apply concepts of keyframing to all types of movements, translation, rotation, and scaling for a simple character. His name is Silly Guy Q. Um, you will notice that there is a crosshair. You might have to zoom out a little bit, or a little icon over top of the head. And you can use that. You can click on that to select the character. That is called a selection handle. And that is a convenient icon for selecting uh, any kind of grouped object or complex object in the in the viewport without having to deal with the group selection mode or outliner or higher graph hypergraph uh, hierarchy hypergraph that's what I'm trying to say and I will show how to create these um, in the next lecture whatever you do don't drag a marquee around the character like even if let's pretend I did not select those blocks it's still gonna not produce the results I wanted the reason for that is because these are individual objects I'm in object mode right now and so for example the scaling will work on each object individually instead of the group node and so we want that so we're going to animate the character jumping from the purple cube to the yellow cube by using the different types of transformations so we're going to go to frame 5 set the scale tool um, scale Y to 0.6 to get a squash started. And we're going to set a key. We're going to make this nice and simple and just use S to set all the keys. We're not going to worry about having a messy set of keyframes right now. So just S, go ahead and set all the keys. And we're going to go to frame 14. We're going to set the scale Y to 0.9. So he's going to stretch up a little bit in comparison to being squashed and the rotate Z it's negative 21 to rotate him forward just a tad. Okay, now we're going to go to frame 20. Set the Y scale to a little past A little past normal. I'm going to do this one interactively so maybe it'll be a little more intuitive. I'm not too worried about the exact numbers, it's not that important, but we're just getting them to stretch up a little bit. So, whoop, you know, we've got kind of this, this beginning of a jump here. 23. We are going to use the move tool. 
and have x go forward to about 4.3 or thereabouts. And the y, we're going to move that up to about 5 or thereabouts and set a key. I accidentally pressed Z there. So we've got this whoop. So in that upward and forward movement will not begin until frame 20 because we were setting keys on every channel. If we had just been doing the rotate and scale, the upward movement would start at frame 0 and then go to frame 23, which is not what we want. We want it to happen right here. Okay, now go to frame 27. Translate X, we want to be 6.8 or thereabouts, and translate Y to negative 1.7. Rotate, we're going to rotate him back to about 25 or so. And I'm going to move him up a little bit so he doesn't get caught inside the block there. And set a key. You notice down here when it says result 10, when you press S, uh, that means 10 keys were set. And if you count up these channels, you'll see there's 10 of them. Those are the 10 keys that were set. We're going to go to frame 29. We're going to rotate this silly guy forward to about zero. We're going to scale him down so that he squashes a touch, about 0.6-ish. Translate X, we're going to move that forward to about 7.2. Translate Y, basically just move it down so he's touching the bricks. Should be right around somewhere around negative 0.2. Set a key. And go to frame 30. Let's scale him back to normal. And set a key there. And let's just play that back and see what that looks like. So, not too bad. Um, I think I'd probably, that stretch right there is happening a little odd. Um, I think I'd probably. want to fix that. So the stretch that's happening right here I think is happening too slowly. It's a little awkward. It should be a, a quick effect. Squash and stretch is a pretty quick thing. Like you can see where he lands. It just kind of plop and it's you know it's barely a few frames here but back here we've got it taking six frames and so he kind of elongates like he's inflating or something. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do to fix that is I want it to take less time. So this is a common newbie animator question is how do I, how do I speed up a movement? You know, where's the, where's the command to speed up a movement or slow down a movement? It doesn't exist. You move your keyframes. So um, to speed up a movement, you, you know, we want to move up the, the we want to speed up the movement happening between these two keyframes. So we want to move these two keyframes closer together. And the way to do that is um, hold down shift and click and drag. And so you will get a selection range. You can use the two arrows on the end to change the selection range. 
if you if you selected too many frames um, or too few. No, I'm sorry. I'm telling you wrong. The, this will scale it. So that won't be entirely apparent unless you select multiple keyframes. So if you have all these and you want them all to be, all of the whole thing to be faster, you would grab this and scale it down. Or slower, you would scale it up. Um, we just want to move this keyframe closer to this one. So I'm going to shift select that and click in the middle to move it. And I'm going to move it well, uh, two or three frames away. So so that timing will be quicker. So, and what happened there is it's, it's helped, but the stretch movement actually starts on this keyframe and then goes through this one to this one. So, you get a stretch from 0.6 to 0.9 right here and that initial stretch is really kind of screwing things up so it's taking too long so um, I'm going to change the value of the scale Y back to 1 on this keyframe and then press S to rekey it. It won't rekey automatically, so if you move off of it, that doesn't stick. And then, instead of having it animate from, from scale 1 to scale 0.9 between frame 5 and 18, I'm going to set another key right here for scale Y1. You gotta get your cursor out of the field, otherwise you're just typing S's into the fields. And then the there will be just a lean forward now, and then a whoop whoop, you know, like a quicker squash and stretch, like the way it's supposed to happen. So um, this is just to give you a feel of how to edit keyframes and move them around, retime, uh, change your timing, retime different movements. So we're going to go into the graph editor for just a moment. We're going to go Windows, Animation Editors, Graph Editor. And what this does, pay close attention now, this is a test question. Um, this shows you a change in value over time. The graph editor shows a change in value over time. The x-axis is the time and the y-axis, the up and down, is the value. So, translate x goes from 0, and then from here it's around 5, well, no, it's not quite 5, it's 4.192, and then up here it's around 7.2. That's the x value. The rotate z changes in value over time in this way. It's really tempting to think of this as a motion path. It is not a motion path. It is a change in value over time. Okay, I've set it hopefully enough that it's sinking in. And again, this is a test question. It is not a motion path. It is a change in value over time. Now one of the things we can do with this that's handy right now, we're going to actually change some uh, values with it in the next unit, but 
all these dead channels like scale X that have these extraneous keyframes that don't do anything these are called static channels they're just dead they're just wasting memory you can click edit um, delete all by type static channels and that gets rid of all that stuff in one quick swoop and it will not mess up your animation so you're only getting rid of of um, the channels which contain keyframes but no changes in value okay um, the scalers jump can benefit from some exaggeration when taking off and landing on the cubes. I'm sorry, the characters jump is what I meant. Um, let's go back to Windows Animation Editor, Graph Editor. And we're going to go to the scale Y. Um, the way you navigate this window and move around is actually the same way you navigate the other windows in Maya. So alt middle click to pan, alt right click to zoom, and you can press F to frame the keys. Um, so if you press F you'll you'll get all the keys together. Now select the keyframe at frame 14 or 16 as it were. 18, that's the one we want. And let's move the point down. With, by middle click dragging, we're going to move this down to point 0.6 and exaggerate that a little further. open off to the side here there you go uh, you can play with that some more um, I want to show how to render your animation now so I'm going to save this as, I'm going to change the name, we'll call it Your Name, Silly Guy Q, and I'm going to close the graph editor. Okay, and there's a couple things I want to show here. Um, first thing we're going to do is um, we should have already done this, but definitely at least by now when we're ready to render, we're going to create a camera. And I don't need an aim. I'm going to switch to camera one. And just zoom out. Get myself a nice shot. Give them a little room to jump there and a little room to to breathe. Something like that. Looks decent. Okay. And so now I'm on camera one. I'm not on perspective anymore. So and by the way, camera one is actually a reasonable name. It's one of the things that you actually probably don't really need to worry about renaming is your cameras, because camera one, camera two is actually a normal name to call your cameras. Um, now I'm going to show you the fail safe first and this is going to happen maybe to some of you I don't know uh, but this is one way to render your animation that if nothing else works at least you can turn it in so um, if, if, it, if you need the fail safe then use it um, 
you know, sometimes things can happen. Sometimes the render takes longer than you anticipated. Sometimes there's glitches. You just don't know. So the failsafe is to, um, you want to make sure that you've got the viewport active that you want to render. So we want to do camera one. That's the only one that's showing, so that's the one that's active. And you're going to right click on the timeline and go to Play Blast option box. Um, you can put the quality at 100. Scale should be at 100, 1.0. Click Save to File, and we'll go Browse. SillyGuy.avi, because we chose AVI format up here, which is fine. Um, YouTube can use the AVI format, and then you click Play Blast. Okay, and what that'll do is it's actually a screen capture. You can see that it has the little camera one thing down here and the little uh, uh, the little axial coordinates indicator here. So it's actually making a literal capture of your screen. This is not a render at all. Um, and that works very well for previews. When you're in production, you can take this and drop it into your... Um, editing software or compositing software and you can start working with it right away um, before the final render passes are all done. Uh, but for for our purposes we can use it as a failsafe if we can't get the renders working. Okay, and then you can upload it to YouTube which I'll get to in a few minutes. Now, um, batch rendering is the way that I want you to do it as long as it works for you. It can be a little tricky. So I'm going to go to my render settings here and if I'm not batch rendering this, like I said, I'm not getting a real render. It's just a preview. Um, but you do have to be aware of some of the settings here now, a few more than before. So image format, first of all, um, you can choose PNG, Targa, um, even JPEG is usually fine. Normally I would say choose something that supports transparency. Well, I say normally. When I say normally, I mean like in, in a real production. Like you would probably be choosing something that, that supports transparency because it's probably going to have layers. So like we would have like a background, like a playground or something behind this guy. Um, so you would want all of this to be transparent so that when you put it on top, the, the um, playground, you know, shows through. We're not doing that, so, you know, uh, JPEG does not support transparency, but we don't really need it either. So if that's the simplest thing and it works, then, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, the next thing you have to set is the frame animation EXT, and if you don't set this, this will not work. If it's name.ext single frame, it's not going to work because that's not what you that's not what you want. You're just going to get one frame. What you want is one of the ones that show name uh, hashtag something something, and I would recommend the last one, name underscore hashtag ext. And you can see up here, it gives you a look at the um, what the file name is going to look like. And this is usually fine. Um, I know if you're going to be using Adobe to compile these frames, then it's fine. Um, other programs, there's lots of programs out there that can compile these frames. Other programs take the alphabetical order very literally. And so you'll get a frame 1, and then a frame 10, and then a frame 2 through 9. And that obviously can be problematic. So that's where frame padding comes in. Um, Frame padding will just add zeros so that that won't happen. Uh, in this case, we only need a frame padding of two, but if you want to just keep it simple, 
set your frame padding to 4 and just leave it there. Uh, you're never going to animate more than 10,000 frames in this class, so, or, you know, probably ever, really. <laughs> so, frame padding of 4 is usually going to be fine. So, as you can see, it adds a number of digits that are equal to that, that make it equal to 4. And now, the, um, even in alphabetical order, it will go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, instead of 1, 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, the next thing that matters to us is frame range. The frame range in this animation actually ends at 50, so we want to set the end frame to 50 on the render as well. And then after that, renderable cameras. Renderable cameras, we're going to choose camera 1. And then image size was at 640 by 80, 480 on this one. That was just to test you. It needs to be at HD 1080. It always needs to be at HD 1080 for everything we do. Okay. Um, render options. In most cases, I'm not going to do it right now, but when you're actually doing your project, do you want to turn off default light? It should turn off default light when you add any light to the scene at all anyway. So um, it's probably fine, but it's good to turn it off. Uh, let's go over to the Maya Software tab. And we're going to make this 3D motion blur production. And then under ray tracing quality, if you are going to be using ray tracing, you turn it on here. Now remember how much extra time ray tracing added to one frame. Now it's going to add a lot more than that, you know. If you're doing it, if you're doing a 50 frame animation, you know that's that's 50 times as much um, extra rendering time that you're going to need. So, as you're doing these animations, if you're using any kind of fancy lighting or surfacing or um, ray tracing, um, motion blur, special effects, any of that stuff. You really want to make sure to get the animation done earlier and then render it. If you are using a play blast, it only takes a few seconds, so not to worry. Uh, motion blur, it's up to you. Um, it's not a necessity. I'm not that worried about it, but if you want to use it, you can use it. It will add a little bit of render time. So, and then pretty much the rest of it is, don't worry about it right now. Okay, so let's close that. And to get these frames, we're going to go to the rendering menu. And we're going to click render. And there should be a batch render here. And we'll see which frame it's on down here. If you open the output window, you can watch the progress. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm having you do it this way, which you might think is a little weird that we're creating a, a still image for every frame, which will be compiled into a, um, an animated movie file. Is that weird? Well, it's the way it's done in the studio, and the reason that it's done that way in the studios is because this is not the last step. Um, the, the next part of the process is usually compositing or um, special effects. You know, there's going to be some layering going on, and they're going to want um, uh, whatever format they want. It's probably the point will be, though, um, an image for each frame with a transparency on it at high resolution, low or no compression. Um, you compress it at the end. You don't want to. You don't want to lose any quality um, at the at any step in the process because there's going to be several steps in the process when you're out there in the real world doing this, doing animation. Uh, and you can see now our result is the rendering has completed. Um, and it leaves a log for you. Usually you don't need to look at it unless something goes wrong. 
but it seems to think everything is good to go. So I'm going to go to my projects folder and I'm going to go to animation demo files. And this will be under images. And you can see that there is a series of images numbered 1 through 50. Now these have to be compiled into a movie. Now the way to do this is um, going to depend. So there's a number of different ways to do it. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of them and if you have another way it's fine with me. All that matters is that you compile it into a movie file and upload it to YouTube. Alright, so method one is real easy uh, if you have Premiere. Uh, if you have Adobe Creative Cloud, you have Premiere. Um, you can open Premiere and start a new project. And I don't have uh, the time, it's not in the scope of this class to go through everything there is to know about Premiere, but um, just how to compile these frames real quick into uh, one sequence where it says import media to start down here just double click that and I'm gonna go to my that images folder from earlier and what I want to do is I want to click on the first image only just the first image and choose image sequence and click open you gotta make sure to choose that image sequence otherwise you'll just get one image and that's not what you want. Um, double click on it and we're going to play it just to make sure it came through correctly. So it did. That is what we expected to see. Now, right click on it and go to export media and your um, Adobe Media encoder will pop up. And for format, um, we're going to choose a YouTube format, which is H.264. And for the preset, you can go all the way down to the bottom, uh, almost all the way down to the bottom, second from the bottom, and choose YouTube 1080p Full HD. Where it says output name, I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to go to my project folder go to movies and I'm going to call it my name silly guy Q and click save so usually the rest is fine at the defaults um, in almost every case so click export and my video was exported successfully now let's take a quick look in the movies folder. And there we go. So, and do you see the difference? This is an actual render versus a preview. So, hopefully, you can see the difference. It's um, it's lit. It's smoothed. It's um, it does not have the words camera one down here. You can't see the grid. So, get it? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, another way to do it is in After Effects. So, I'm going to open After Effects and I'm going to start a new project or new composition. So this is something I've been seeing, and I don't think it really means anything. It doesn't seem to cause any problems for me, at least. So 
I usually just, I've tried to fix it a couple times and nothing seems to happen, so I usually just continue with known issues for now until they get it figured out. It's something that popped up recently. But anyway, um, I am going to close this and I'm going to choose new composition from footage. And I'm going to go to images. And I'm going to select the first image only once again. And make sure that sequence is checked, which usually it is. There we go. So I want to um, render this now. So let's go to composition, add to render queue. And where it says output module lossless, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to click on format options. No, I'm sorry. I change this to um, QuickTime. Click on Format Options. I should be seeing H.264 there, but I'm not. Okay, well, um, at any rate, this will this will work like this. It will produce a really huge file, but it'll work. Click OK. Output two. go back to my project folder, animation demo files, go to movies, click save, and then click render. And you'll hear the little chime. And let's go back to the movies folder now. Just make sure it came through. My computer can't play it, but it went through. So, but there's a huge, huge size size difference between those two. Um, I thought I should have H.264 on there somewhere, but it doesn't really matter. Um, YouTube will compress them anyway, so um, don't worry about uploading huge files to YouTube to use a program called FCheck that comes with Maya. Now, FCheck may not have been pinned by default. You might have to search for it. So you can type in fcheck and you will see the app here. Uh, if you're on Mac, I believe you can press command space and search for fcheck. The icon for it should look like a little camera. This comes with Maya, so I know everybody has it. And I will open this and this is the most rudimentary bare bones ghetto uh, way of doing this that you could imagine but it works so um, I am going to open animation and I am going to navigate to it put me right in my documents folder so that's handy because that's where I've been saving these so I'm going to go to Maya projects animation demo files images and just to make sure I don't really like the icon view I'm going to go to the detailed list view and you can do that on Mac too it's just a different button it's like one of the things up here you click it and it changes to the list view so I'm going to select Silly Guy Q1, and I'm going to set my end frame as 50. Okay, and I hope I'm doing this right. Let's find out. I'm going to click Open. Let's 
So it actually does stop at 50, so. So the animation stops a little sooner, but whatever. That's fine. And there you go, it's playing, yada yada. That's lovely. Stop, and all I have to do really is click File, Save Animation, and I am going to save this as... Uh, that's not the options I expected to see. If you don't have um, any of the Adobe Creative Cloud apps, Virtual Dub might work for you if you go to virtualdub.org. This will only work for you if you have a Windows PC. Uh, it will not work on Mac, uh, unless you have a Windows emulator for your Mac. Um, you can download this and do uh, go through the documentation if you need to, but it should be able to do basically the same thing that I showed earlier. If you go to the downloads page and download at SourceForge, probably could just go right to this page if you want it, <coughs> and um, just choose the 32-bit or 64-bit version. If you have a Mac, you and you don't have Adobe Creative Cloud, um, which I would assume most of you should, being in the program, but at any rate, um, you can go to FCheck and do what I showed, and the save, and I think it would be under save animation, should include MOV. If that doesn't work, we can that was my box. We can go into Maya and just do a render to an AVI or an MOV if you have to. So if I go to render options under file output, um, this is not ideal either. If you can do it with image sequences, I want you to do it that way. But you can output to an AVI and uh, QuickTime movie from here. And these might not give you a whole lot of options as far as compression goes. So, as you can see, it's not very full featured because it's not really made to be something you do this with. So, the difference between that and a uh, Play Blast is that this will actually really render it as opposed to a Play Blast which is just a preview. This is not just a preview, this is an actual render. So you would choose the um, AVI and then um, make sure you know where the file's going and then you you can go to your batch render and it will make the AVI or, or QuickTime MOV, whichever one you choose. Now I want to go to um, YouTube and upload now, uh, but this part's important. Please don't miss this bit. You have to use your LCC account, so I can't accept any work from outside sources. So do not use your personal YouTube account. Make sure it's coming from LCC. How do you make sure it's coming from LCC? Well. Go to mylcc.edu, log in, go to student email, click on the grid of nine dots where it says Google Apps, and then just go down to YouTube, click YouTube, and then it will usually um, put you right into your account. If it doesn't, you can see I'm still in my personal account here. I can go down to switch account and go to my LCC account. Okay, so now I'm on my LCC account. It's very important that you use your LCC account when submitting your homework. Okay, so now we're going to upload the, those compiled movies, click Create, Upload Video, and 
we're going to go to, you can just drop it on here if you want to. You can navigate to the file any way you want to do it. So even though this one won't play on my computer, YouTube still knows what to do with it. Um, so I can use that one. I can use the other one that I compiled with the YouTube compression. It doesn't really matter. I can use the, uh, wow, that one's huge. I can use the Play Blast as well. So this will give you a link. And that is what you will post with your self-analysis. Um, and all of these settings are up to you pretty much. But you need to know, go to visibility and, uh, sure, for kids. Go to visibility and if you want your video to be publicly searchable by everybody, choose public. And that's anybody, any random schmuck can search for your video and find it. If you don't want that, choose unlisted. Do not choose private because private will not be viewable by, by us from that link. Just unlisted and public, depending on whether you want to be searchable or not. So when this all finishes, you can click save and copy this link into your self-analysis um, and we'll be able to watch your animation.